Okay, good afternoon. Um, so like Jeremy said, I'm going to be uh, chatting uh, about uh, non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections. I'm going to probably stop my video though for the presentation. Um, okay, so I decided to do this presentation um, because whilst I've seen a couple of disseminated NTM infections, I hadn't really thought about or realized the kind of spectrum of disease that NTMs can cause. Um, and so, yeah, I learned a lot about um, kind of at all this um, whilst doing this presentation and hopefully I can uh, kind of give you a few tips and um, teach you something along the way. Um, uh, just sorry, there we go. Okay, so mycobacterium causing human disease on um, the slide on the left. Obviously, we know the mycobacterial uh, tuberculosis complex pretty well. Um, it also includes mycobacterial leprae, so which is causing uh, leprosy. Um, and then, in terms of the rapid or oh, the non tuberculous mycobacterium. Um, this classification is based on the Runyon classification, um, which um, divides it into um, the, or it's based on the rate of growth. So you've got your rapidly growing um, NTMs and your slow growing NTMs. And then the slow growing NTMs are um, classified according to the production of yellow pigment and then whether this is produced in the dark or after exposure. So I'm not going to be talking about all of these NTMs, but you can see there's quite a lot. And actually this list isn't extensive. Um, uh, but yeah, we'll be going through a few of them. So non-tuberculous mycobacterium are mycobacterium other than um, TB and leprosy. They're aerobic acid fast bacilli. They are ubiquitous recovered from water, soil, animals, milk, and food. They've got a thick lipid rich cell wall, and this means they can withstand extremes of heat and pH. And as TB is decreasing in areas of socioeconomic advancement, NTMs are increasing and their relevance to human disease is becoming more apparent. So the spectrum of disease um, and what I'm kind of what my talk is, is based on um, is um, divided, oh, I'm going to be chatting about these four main topics, so pulmonary disease, lymphadenitis, skin and soft tissue, and then uh, ending off with disseminated disease. Okay, so starting with pulmonary disease, this uh, data is from a systemic review and meta-analysis, which was done in 2017 on NTMs isolated from pulmonary samples in sub-Saharan Africa. So this is specific to southern, or South Africa, uh, and these were taken from pulmonary samples. So these figures are um, not based on uh, studies that analyzed um, the, uh, analyzed it using the uh, IDSA criteria for disease. So these could have been colonizers, but um, in any case, they found that mycobacterium avium complex was most common at 30%, and this was followed by um, uh, scrofule scrofulaceum, uh, Kansasai, and Gordonay. And this, um, in this population, the prevalence of HIV was just under 20%. So when they only took uh, studies that used the IDSA, IDSA criteria for infection, um, they were left with only three studies, and that made Kansasai um, a lot more prevalent at 74%. Um, uh, and then again, followed by a scrofulaceum, uh, MAC, and then abscesses was quite a small percentage. Sorry, I'm just trying to, I just can't see my headings when, so I just want to see if I can move this. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay. Okay, so when talking about risk factors on um, acquiring pulmonary NTM disease, um, your environment can be a risk factor. So atmospheric moisture has been linked to increased um, pulmonary disease prevalence, as well as exposure to certain water sources um, as a potential route of infection. And then there's also been um, reports of isolation of NTM species from soil samples, which resemble those that were found in respiratory isolates from uh, pulmonary disease cases. So having structural lung disease increases your risk, specifically um, and especially having bronchiectasis, COPD, or interstitial lung disease. 
having cystic fibrosis is an, um, a risk factor, increasing age, and immunosuppressant medication. So specifically biological agents like tumor necrosis factor alpha inhibitors, um, oral and inhaled um, corticosteroids. So immunosuppression, um, the evidence is somewhat conflicting. So it suggests that there is downregulation of your immune response when you have NTM pulmonary disease. But whether this is truly a predisposing factor or as a result of the disease um, remains unanswered. And then genetics again is, um, isn't confirmed as a risk factor. Um, so the only evidence for a genetic predisposition uh, implicates the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator gene, um, a, a mutation of that as a, a risk factor, but um, data for other genes is inconsistent. It's also difficult to decide whether the mutations of that gene um, predispose one to bronchiectasis, which is in itself a risk factor, or um, if it's an independent contributor to disease susceptibility. Okay, so pulmonary disease um, uh, comes in different clinical presentations, um, and these are often with a certain phenotype. So those patients with pre-existing -exist structural lung disease are generally in a white middle-aged or older men, and this is often with a history of smoking and underlying COPD. These patients um, resemble TB uh, clinically and on imaging, although symptoms are often less severe than TB. There's uh, extensive uh, lung damage on diagnosis because the symptoms are often indolent and so continue for long periods of time prior to diagnosis. And they'll usually have upper lobe infiltrates with cavities. The other group of people with structural lung disease are in patients with bronchiectasis from prior TB or cystic fibrosis. And these are most uh, mainly in older adults, but there isn't an association with the male sex or smoking. They'll present with a cough, fatigue, sometimes loss of weight, and then a new infiltrate in the um, previously affected lung zones. And people will um, often or mostly think it's TB initially um, or TB reactivation. Then there are patients um, who have a no structural lung disease or pre-existing structural lung disease. And the majority of these subjects are women. Um, uh, they're generally over 50 years uh, are postmenopausal, taller and thinner than average. And some studies have um, suggested that they have a higher than average prevalence of pectus excavatum, scoliosis and mitral valve prolapse. So there's a speculation that um, hormonal factors connected tissue abnormalities or low adiposity might play a role in disease. So the reason I have this um, picture up is it's, um, it's being called Lady Windermere syndrome. Uh, and this is after a Victorian character with ex um, excessively particular manners. Um, and this was in the play uh, by Oscar Wilde and it was called Lady Windermere's Fan. So it was hypothesized that um, she or um, voluntarily uh, suppressed her cough um, to maintain manners. And um, uh, it was suggested that elderly women who did this uh, led to retain secretions and therefore developed uh, bronchiectasis. So these patients um, experience chronic progressive respiratory symptoms like a persistent cough. They can have loss of weight. Usually there isn't a, fe uh, a fever and they'll have recurrent uh, respiratory infest, uh, infections. So radiologically, uh, it's associated with small nodules and cylindrical bronchiectasis. And then frequently it involves the right middle lobe and lingula. So like uh, exactly in this CT scan, you've got most of your bronchiectasis um, in this lingula area. So I thought that was fascinating. Um, it can present as a solitary pulmonary nodule and it will look a lot like lung cancer and so patients will be worked up for lung cancer um, but find out that it is um, just or it is it's an NTM infection. And then the last presentation is a hypersensitivity pneumonitis and this is often from hot tub exposure. It's thought that the water jets promote um, aerosolization of the bacteria, which then one inhales um, and causes a, a, a pneumonitis. 
So patients will present with dyspnea, cough, and fever. Um, patients have been treated with or without corticosteroids. Um, they, people have also tried antimicrobial therapy. Um, and there's actually been equally good um, results as long as the um, source of exposure, so the hot tub, is removed. So chest uh, radiographs usually show uh, diffuse fine nodules. Um, it can have a reticular nodular um, opacities and areas of consolidation. And then CT findings include um, ill-defined ground glass central lobular nodules, or just a more diffuse ground glass opacity. And then there can be air trapping on expiratory uh, examination. So going on to diagnosis of pulmonary NTM disease. Um, so this can often actually be difficult because um, it's extremely important to distinguish between transient infection, colonization, contamination, and true infection. So the uh, American Thoracic Society, the European Respiratory Society, ICMID, and IDSA all jointly endorsed this uh, diagnostic criteria. So firstly, patients need to have symptoms and they can be local uh, or general. They are variable and quite nonspecific and they can be influenced by pre-existing lung disease. Um, and fever and weight loss are a, a lot less frequent um, as you would kind of expect in, um, uh, in, patient, in a patient with mycobacterial uh, tuberculosis. So patients need to have symptoms. They also need to have characteristic radiological findings. So um, the or radiographic pattern of disease is um, separated into predominantly fibrocavitatory or no nodular bronchiectatic um, with, uh, with less common findings like solitary nodules or pleural thickening. And then this type of pattern generally depends on the type of NTM that uh, you're infected with or one is infected with and then your geographical location. So you need symptoms, characteristic radiological findings, and then a microbiological diagnosis. And you need at least one of um, these three um, diagnostics. So at least um, two or more positive sputum cultures, a positive culture from a uh, bronchial wash or lavage, or a biopsy together with a culture on either sputum or bronchial washings. And then lastly, it need, you need to have exclusion of other diagnoses. So uh, you need to exclude TB, uh, malignancy, or fungal infections. So other investigations that can um, so you, be used to support your diagnostics or your diagnosis, you can have um, uh, nucleic acid probes for certain NTM species. There are skin tests available, well, no, they're not available. There are skin tests, but they're not commercially available or approved for diagnostics yet. But um, they've been shown that some dual skin tests with uh, tuberculosis versus NTM tuberculins can discriminate between NTM and prior disease. Um, it's one of the, the most difficult things is trying to de de um determine whether you have NTM or TB disease. So this could help. And then currently there is investigation into serology to distinguish between particularly mycobacterium avium complex from TB. Okay, so going on to treatment, this depends on the uh, species cultured. It's generally a three to four drug regimen. It should be based on drug sensitivity testing. And then it normally will consist of a macrolide, um, erythromycin, ethambutyl, and then sometimes an aminoglycoside is added with um, cavitatory MAC, uh, refractory MAC, or xenopia infection. And then duration is for at least 12 months. Okay, so moving on to uh, NTM lymphadenitis. So this is mostly seen in, in immunocompetent children, less than five years, and then sometimes seen in immunocompromised adults. The most common species um, that causes lymphadenitis is MAC, uh, Mycobacterium haemophilum, and then Mycobacterium scrofulaceum. So lymphadenitis in children, as I said, generally uh, occurs in the ages one to five. Uh, um, oropharyngeal mucosa is the portal of entry, 
and um, they generally will get it in their cervicofacial lymph nodes and especially the submandibular one. So they'll present with a unilateral, non-tender enlarged node. Um, their skin will then change. So it normally starts off as pink, like in this picture. It will then become violaceous. It then becomes thin and can suppurate through a sinus tract. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't get any data. There isn't any available data, um, local data, to see kind of what the main species are and um, uh, kind of epidemiological information. Um, so there, there just isn't anything um, local. So when diagnosing lymphadenitis, particularly in children, you can use the tuberculin skin test, although I, I found that it, it doesn't look like it's very helpful. So a tuberculin skin test shows a delayed type hypersensitivity reaction uh, against mycobacterial antigens, and it will generally become positive two to 10 weeks after the infection. So more than 15 millimeters can be due to any mycobacterium. Five to nine millimeters can be due to your BCG vaccination. Um, and then less than that is a negative test, but then you can also have false negatives. So yeah, I'm not sure how, how useful this, this test can be. Um, specimens are then taken for uh, AFBs. You can then um, use these specimens to culture um, or do a PCR, and then you can also do histology. So these specimens can be uh, pus, from your uh, fistulous drainage, an FNA, or an excisional biopsy. So excisional biopsies are actually curative, and so they're preferred if you really, if you have a strong suspicion of NTM lymphadenitis. Culture um, can take a, a long while, though, um, up to six weeks. So the problem with diagnostics, as kind of in um, pulmonary TB is that these patients, um, it's really difficult to differentiate between NTM infection and mycobacterial um, tuberculosis infection. This table can be helpful, um, but the features aren't um, exclusively found in one or the other, and they can overlap. So moving on to treatment, Surg uh, surgical excision is curative and it provides the best sample for diagnosis and drug, drug sensitivity. Um, it has a superior cure rate uh, to medication. And although there's a risk of damage to the facial nerve, if the preauricular or intraparotid lymph nodes are involved, um, it is the kind of best option. You can use curatage uh, if the excision isn't possible, but then healing and cure rates are a lot lower. And then um, incision and drainage is contraindicated as there's a high probability for developing a chronically draining sinus tract, and there's an increased risk of uh, recurrence. So anti-mycobacterial -my therapy is generally used for patients who aren't surgical candidates, or it's used in combination with curatage. The optimum treatment for lymphadenitis um, is undefined, but combination therapy using clarithromycin or rifampin with or without uh, ethambutyl might be beneficial. Antibacterials alone without surgery has moderate success, about 60 to 70%, and then you still might develop a draining sinus. And then the last um, approach that you could use is just a watch and wait or an observational approach. And uh, this is used for patients with incomplete excision of abnormal tissue or recurrent lymphadenitis. So a, system, a systematic review of pediatric cervicofacial NTM lymphadenitis reported an adjusted mean cure rate of 98% with complete excision, 73% in antibiotic therapy alone, and then 70% for um, conservative management. Okay, so then moving on to what I think is like the most exciting form of the NTM infection are the skin and soft tissue infections. So skin and soft tissue NTM infections usually uh, follow trauma in water. So like swimming pools, aquariums, natural bodies of water and foot baths that aren't cleaned properly. 
And these are generally at the site of uh, a surgical procedure, vascular catheters, injections, piercings, tattoos, or acupuncture. So um, I'm going to be starting with, I'm going to go through a few species, oh, sorry, of, oh, sorry, the um, skin and soft tissue infections can be polymorphous, which uh, contributes to their delay in diagnosis. Um, most are painless. And, and now I'm going to be going through um, some species that have been uh, implicated in these diseases. So uh, I'm going to start with the rapidly growing NTMs. So Mycobacterium abscessus, fortuitum, and um, chelone are the most commonly um, occurring species um, out of the rapidly growing NTM group. So abscessus and chelone are associated uh, generally with immunosuppression, and they will present with multiple lesions. And then fortuitum is usually an immunocompetent patient and will present commonly with a single lesion. Okay, so this is a picture of a patient with an infection with uh, Mycobacterium abscessus. Um, it's a 71 year old woman um, and she had a weak history of multiple painful erythematous nodules um, on her left arm. So she was or is a diabetic and um, she had received an injection in this area um, a few weeks prior to this presentation. She'd also been taking oral steroids for about two years for treatment of her osteoarthritis. This is another example of an abscessus um, infection. So this is a 69 year old female. She was a newly diagnosed diabetic um, and she had originally presented with swelling, nodules, ulcers and pain of her right leg. Six months previous to this time, the patient had been impaled by a bamboo pole. Um, I'm not entirely sure how that happened, but um, this was then followed by gradual emergence of skin redness, suppuration and ulceration. So she presented to her hospital and she was treated with antibiotics and debridement and was subsequently discharged. Unfortunately, though, she represented um, with this um, image and um, as her nodules had persisted. And so she was readmitted where diagnosis of um, NTM infection was finally made and she was able to receive proper treatments. Okay, so this is an example of Mycobacterium chelone. This is the left form of a 68 year old man with uh, cutaneous nodules. Um, and he had been taking infliximab and prednisone for ulcerative colitis. So you can see that those two um, rapidly growing NTMs uh, were mostly present in immunocompromised individuals um, and had multiple lesions, as I had said previously. These are examples of um, Mycobacterium fortuitum, um, and there's a, quite a few um, lesions in this top picture, but the, the other two are single lesions. Okay, so this really cool NTM is Mycobacterium marinum. Um, it's a slow growing, so moving on to the slow growing NTMs. So um, this is normally associated with trauma in or exposure of traumatized skin to water. It'll, um, you'll see the lesions uh, most often on the dorsum of the hands and the feet or on elbows or knees. So this can present as a papule which develops into a shallow ulcer and then can heal with the scar. There can be deep tissue involvement like a tenosynovitis. And then um, the coolest presentation is this nodular lymphangitis. So these are uh, examples of Mycobacterium marinum infection. So the um, image on the left is the sporotrichoid form. Um, and this occurs when the infection spreads along the lymphatic vessels to reach the regional lymph nodes. Um, producing multiple nodules, um, and it resembles, um, as the name suggests, sporotrichosis. So this image is, um, oh, the, sorry, then the, uh, the middle image is of a 51-year-old man who had sustained an injury due to a wood splint on that same finger whilst he was working on his boat about 15 months prior to admission. 
After he removed the splinter, he developed this painless chronic swelling um, of that ring finger, which persisted for months. A month before the admission, he would received a local steroid injection in that finger as um, someone thought that he might possibly have gout. But this then uh, worsened the swelling. So he was admitted for um, an incision and drainage, which was performed. Um, and extensive granulation tissue down to the tendon sheath was found. And so he was diagnosed with tenosynovitis um, caused by the Mycobacterium marinum um, on culture. And then that last image on the right is of a warty varicose plaque, and this um, has quite an irregular border. Okay, so the next um, NTM is Mycobacterium ulcerans. Again, slow growing. Uh, it causes what the Beruli ulcer. Transmission is linked again to contaminated water. Um, it'll start as a painless nodule. Uh, it then develops into an ulcer with uh, what's called undermined edges. That's what an undermined edge looks like. Um, and it then just slowly enlarges. It's, it's a horrific um, infection. Um, it can involve an, it can involve and often involves deep tissues. And then it'll heal um, with contractures if it's near a joint. So these are two examples of um, Mycobacterium ulcerans infection. The first image is a, a typical undermined lesion. So again, you can see the kind of deep um, area over there. And this is a, a, a lesion with necrotic debris in the right thigh of a seven-year-old girl. And then the image on the right is a long-standing progressive ulceration of the left leg of an 11-year-old girl. Um, unfortunately, earlier attempts had been made to control the progression, but it failed. And so a severe contracture um, at the knee had already occurred, which you can see over there. And then lastly, um, Mycobacterium avium complex. So um, this can present as either a primary lesion. This is usually in immunocompetent patients and after it's often after traumatic inoculation. And again, we'll start as a nodule and then can ulcerate, or it can present as a cutaneous manifestation of disseminated disease in immunocompromised patients. And this can cause a variety of lesions. So this is an example of um, an ulcer secondary to disseminated MAC. And this was seen in an HIV positive patient and it was um, a patient at Helen Joseph Hospital and uh, Jeremy actually took this picture. So when diagnosing skin and um, soft tissue infections by, um, with NTM, um, clinical suspicion is um, very important. So does the patient have a history of water sports? Do they have a history of a penetrating injury? Um, do they, did a normal routine bacterial culture get sent and was this negative? And was this patient given anti-staph and anti-strep antibiotics and it didn't resolve? You then want to uh, get a biopsy or an aspirate or drainage and send that off for culture and to, so that you can confirm the species and then also perform susceptibility testing. Often you'd want to discuss the specimen collection and transport with microbiology because then um, you, this might increase your yield. So PCR is really helpful to get species, but this wouldn't um, assist with um, susceptibility testing. And then the last thing is you need to decide on your clinical significance if you do get a culture back with um, an NTM. So is this, again, is this result of contamination because NTMs are ubiquitous in the environment um, or is it um, a significant infectious um, result? So things that are gonna increase the likelihood of it being significant is recovery from multiple specimens or if it's found in large quantities and uh, gives you a positive AFB smear. So uh, when treating um, skin and soft tissues, um, it can be quite difficult because there aren't any um, randomized controlled trials um, to guide therapy. So recommendations are generally based on case series, 
uh, in vitro susceptibility testing and clinical experience. It is also species specific. So it often requires a combination of surgery and antimicrobials. Surgery um, is indicated for debridement and serious localized disease. Um, it will also be indicated in tenosynovitis, uh, osteomyelitis, um, device associated infection or deep soft tissue infection. If you are in, um, going to be using antimicrobials, um, you never want to use single therapy with a macrolide, um, especially in fortuitum and abscesses, as they have inducible macrolide resistance. So the rapidly growing um, NTMs, you'll usually use two drugs, and this is based on uh, drug sensitivity testing. Uh, Mycobacterium marinum is two drugs again, uh, usually a macrolide and ethambutol, and then you'll add rifampicin in deep tissue infections. Alterans, you use clarithromycin and rifampicin for eight weeks, and then a MAC, you will use three treatments um, or medications, macrolide, RIF, and ethambutal for up to a year. Okay, and moving on to the last um, uh, manifestation of NTM disease, which is disseminated disease. So this is usually in immunocompromised individuals, especially those with HIV and a CD4 of 50, and these are the patients that I've mainly seen. They uh, also can occur though in other immunocompromised patients, so in hematological malignancy, post-transplant and uh, immunosuppressive therapy. So Mycobacterium avium complex is the most common globally. Um, in terms of locally, uh, there was a study done at um, Helen Joseph Hospital, again by Jeremy. Um, and in um, that study, it um, showed that Mycobacterium avium, followed by Cansasi and then intracellulare were the most common species in patients with disseminated disease in the years to, uh, 2016 and 2017. So clinical manifestations can be very nonspecific or it can reflect the organ that's involved. So often we'll see patients with constitutional symptoms and then um, diarrhea will um, make uh, people think then that instead of TB that this could be um, an NTM infection. You can have cytopenias, lymphadenopathy or hepatosplenomegaly. You can have uh, diarrhea, as mentioned, hepatomegaly or raised um, liver enzymes. You can have pulmonary involvement, and then there can be skin involvement. Um, so interestingly enough, actually, in HIV-positive patients, palpable lymph nodes um, and lung involvement is actually not common at all. Autopsy studies uh, demonstrated that patients with AIDS and disseminated MAC have involvement of most of their internal organs, even if localizing signs and symptoms aren't apparent, which can be quite scary. Okay, in terms of diagnosis, most diagnoses are made um, on culture, um, and especially um, from what I've seen, we've made the diagnosis on culture, either by blood or more invasive in, uh, investigations like bone marrow or lymph node aspiration. PCR can be done on any specimen that's able to be cultured. And then um, additional tests like imaging can um, support the diagnosis. And then using a, a lamb could possibly assist you in your diagnosis. And so that same study that I was talking about done at Helen Joseph, um, again by Jeremy, looked at 26 patients diagnosed with di disseminated NTM uh, disease and how many of them had a positive urine lamb, which we usually use um, to diagnose uh, TB. So mycobacterial TB co-infection was investigated in all of these patients, all 26 of them, and it was confirmed in only three of the 26. So their findings demonstrated an unexpectedly high rate of lamb positivity in these subjects with disseminated NTM infection. So they couldn't definitively determine whether the lamb positivity in their patients represented either an undiagnosed concomitant disseminated TB or cross-reactivity with the NTM antigen or whether it was a combination of the two. So they suggested it was plausible that NTM cross-reactivity might account for at least some of the positive lamb results. 
Um, and so, yeah, it could possibly help if you are worried about um, disseminated MTM. And then lastly, treatment um, in disseminated disease involves immune reconst uh, in, 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 sorry, involves immune reconstitution. Um, and this is essential. So ARVs um, in HIV positive patients should be urgent. Macrolides are the cornerstone of therapy and ethambutyl is there to protect the macrolide from resistance. And then you can add um, a third drug and this is generally based on expert opinion. So there is some evidence for adding arifamycin. It's only from two studies. The one study um, uh, used a, a dose of rifibutin um, at 300 milligrams per day. And they found that there was actually no additional clinical benefit uh, to just using the two drug regimen, but it did result in reducing relapse due to macrolide resistance strains. Um, and then the other study which used rifibutin at a dose of 450 milligrams a day said that it appeared to offer a modest clinical benefit um, over using just two drugs. So up to date recommends a third drug, um, but they specify this only in patients that are failing ART um, or if there's a high mycobacterial burden. And they um, give the options um, of a rifamycin, a fluoroquinolone or an aminoglycoside um, if you are wanting to use a third drug. Usually we'll give um, patients um, a therapy for at least a year, um, and until their CD4 count is above 100 for six months. Okay, so just to end off the presentation, um, I just wanted to give a few kind of take home points. So uh, NTMs, as you can see, causes a wide spectrum of disease. Um, just to remember that they can cause infection in immunocompetent individuals as well as immunocompromised, which um, I think is often what we most see uh, what most commonly we see. Um, it's important to distinguish colonization from infection. Think about NTMs in children who present with lymphadenopathy, and then ask about exposures when assessing um, skin lesions that aren't healing or um, aren't resembling anything common. And that's it. Oh, thanks so much, Lauren. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions for Lauren, please just type it in the, in the Q&A box or else raise your hand. I think, Lucille, you've got your hand up. I'm gonna unmute you. There you go. You can unmute yourself. <laughs> okay. So thanks very much, Jeremy. That was a lovely talk, Lauren. Well done. It's a very complex subject. You made it really simple and covered a whole lot. Um, <laughs> just to add to your take home messages, I think the history is really important about where the person comes from geographically and what their exposures are and what their job is. Um, and I think that specifically speaks to marine um, the hobbies and uh, uh, people who work with fish. But um, my series of one uh, was a miner. He was, um, uh, I think he was from Israel and he was working on a mine in Angola and he had the skin lesion, uh, which was biopsied and stained with everything under the sun. And they saw acid fast bacilli, um, but really didn't put two and two together. And he had quite a lot of um, treatment for um, the TB and other mycobacteria. Um, but what he had was, was ulcerans, uh, mycobacteria uh. ulcerans. And in fact, it, it was confirmed, it's quite some years ago. Um, it was confirmed in, in the reference lab at that stage was in Belgium. I think there's one in Cameroons now. Um, but things that don't, that, you know, it occurs in tropical and subtropical areas um, and not in South Africa. And we kind of didn't think much further. But because I'd sat next to um, Francois, who was the, the, the Mrs. Ulcerans of the world at some dinner party, I thought, gosh, I'm sure this is one of hers. And, and it was. Um, but one doesn't always think about it. So geographical, occupational exposure history, very important. But a great talk. Thanks very much. Well done. Okay. Great. Thanks, Jaseel. Um, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Lars got a question saying, are there any IGRAs that include NTM antigens in research or in clinical use? 
Any? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Any? Uh, Igris, the interferon gamma oh. release assays. Um, not that I saw. Um, oh, so they, again, it was kind of almost a bit like the tuberculin skin test. They were like, you can use it, but it's, you know, it'll probably tell you that you've had a previous exposure or you've got latent um, infection with TB. Uh, it, it wasn't very helpful, but they said that you could use it and it could possibly help. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think we have any commercially available. The, I mean, I think, Lyle, the one problem in it is a little bit like uh, Dave's question last week about why there are no gene experts for, for NTMs. And I think the big problem there is just the amount of colonization you detect. And, and, and you know, so the, the fact that you become colonized so often means that your immune system is going to see it eventually. And so you really do get quite low yield from that sort of test in, in, for the NTMs, as opposed to TB, where outside of a place like South Africa, if you lived, let's say, in the UK or something, you're never likely to see TB at all. So a positive IGRA there would be pretty useful. Um, okay, any other questions? I'm just seeing um, sensitivity testing for NTM is a question. So when and what's available? So, so drug sensitivity testing, uh, Lauren, what's, what's available in, in South Africa? Um, so I think we can do um, most, well, so it, there'll be, not 100% sure. I know that we can do it, but I'm not 100% sure um, if it's kind of to all um, drugs or if it's um, if it's only certain drugs. Um, but we, we definitely do the susceptibility testing. Um, it'll be, um, be to, uh, we test for macrolides and ethambutyl. Um, and I'm pretty sure we do the fluoroquinolones as well. But Jeremy will, will probably know more than I do. No, that, that's great. Yeah. So, I mean, so I think all the big labs, so the NST is a reference lab for the mycobacteriology will do susceptibility testing for NTMs, but it's on request, obviously, only, and you have to make very sure it's not a, not a colonizer. So they usually prefer the disseminated ones and, and not the rest um, to do that. But, but so, and then Lance Nampath, for example, will do uh, uh, MICs, so you can look at, and, and then they often report breakpoints, although they not well defined. So the big limitation is really just the interpretation of them more than the actual MIC, more than testing for susceptibility. You can obviously, for some of the common ones, like for MAC, um, there are also PCR based um, tests which can look for macrolide and uh, for, uh, aminoglycoside rather um, susceptibility by that method as well, uh, apart from uh, culture and, and um, phenotypic susceptibility. So there's a range, but the, the big problem for weird reasons that no one's entirely sure of is that so many of these things don't correlate anywhere with efficacy. So you, know, if you can look at the MICs for 12 different drugs, but it's not clear what you should actually be looking at. Um, you know, and like, for example, like Lauren said, for, for MAC, it's really just the macrolides and the, and the monoglycosides and, and nothing else, regardless of whether it looks like it's susceptible or not. Um, so it's quite a tricky field. Um, Oh, and uh, Lucille's typed in something great, just about a liposuction complication. Uh, she's seen uh, Chiloni for tutum abscesses. Yes, all the rapidly growing ones from the skin. <laughs> That's, so another 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 downside to liposuction. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's another question. Oh, okay. I think we've answered that. Is susceptibility testing based on? Uh, I presume they mean phenotypical molecular testing, so it is a bit of both, but most of it's uh, phenotypic, but some of it is, is genotypic, depending on the lab and which bug you're looking at. Um, yeah, I think that's most of the questions, and I, mean, I agree with you, Lauren. I mean, I think that the challenge is we don't, you know, if you see what you see, in other words, if you're in a setting where you see a lot of HIV, you see a lot of disseminated disease, but, you know, forget, and I, I think in, in my my opinion, at least, the the rapidly growing ones on the skin, the abscesses for tutum chiloni, are the hardest because they're so often neglected. You know, people don't think of that when they see a chronic skin and soft tissue infection. Um, they don't ask about it, and they don't know what to do to treat it. You know, they don't often send off the samples for it. We had a, a doctor who had a terrible skin infection on her finger. Again, looked exactly like your photos, and was eventually found to be a non-tuberculous mycobacterium. But went through colleagues, you know, uh, about six, twelve months worth and multiple biopsies mm. and operations and everything. It's tricky, you know. Um, I think most people will think about it if it's in the lymph node or or that. But skin and soft tissue, people don't tend to think of it, especially when it's chronic. I don't know what your kind of experience with that's been. 
Yeah, no, I, that's why I'm, I'm so glad that I, I did the presentation because then I learned about it because I don't, I'm not, I don't think I was thinking about it um, as much as I should be um, when looking at skin, um, skin lesions. Um, so, and from what I read, I, and just, and also from those, um, just the, the case um, studies, you know, you know, 15 months would go by and some poor lady had debridement and anti- uh, antibiotics and another guy had waited a year and had an yeah I mean so a lot of them um, weren't picked up really uh, early on and so they just progress. Yeah, agreed. Uh, see, Ripka said that's also been associated with pedicures. <laughs> yes, that's She's why so I put the foot bath there. And that <laughs> freaks me out a lot because you know you uh, they, it's it's because they haven't been cleaned properly and then you get a pedicure which obviously nicks your like a bit of your skin or a bit of your cuticle and then you're putting your feet into unclean foot baths and then next thing, NTM <laughs> infection. Um, Charlotte, you've got your hand up. Hi everyone, hi Jeremy. It's just further to the case Lucille mentioned, uh, actually, and further to what we're discussing now about how people don't think about NTM infections. I actually remember seeing that patient that Lucille talked about with Natalie Bayless in the derm clinic at CMJH. He had come in with his dad and they were both diamond miners, I think in the Congo. And uh, what stuck with me was that as Lucille said, he had had previous debridement, was seen by surgeons, they had cut out the lesion, he had scars on his legs. And um, eventually when we saw him, and I think with conversations with the NICD and finally got the diagnosis, they were so happy um, that the father actually offered um, to give Natalie and I diamonds as payment. <laughs> and it stuck with me ever since. So it was um, of a junior microbiologist, but it was such an interesting case. And what stuck with me was that no one thought about NTM. So it's just a further illustration of that point. Thanks. Thanks, Charlotte. That's, that's such a great point. <laughs> Such a great story. Um, cool. I see in the in the uh, I'm just going to read it out. So there's uh, Darwin saying that there's some cross reactivity with Igris in infection with Kansai C. marinum and Zilgai. We'll have to check if it's both Quantiferin and Elispot um, Igris assays. Okay. I'm just going to pass that through. Um, and then Lyle's asking, are there any, any comments on the use of some of the new anti-TB drugs like Bedacolin for NTMs? Uh, yes. Um, so we, I haven't, um, I, I didn't actually read about them. I, I kind of saw the headlines, but yes, Bedacolin is being used um, often for um, patients. Well, I actually only read about the disseminated NTMs that were resistant um, to a lot of the drugs like the aminoglycosides and uh, macrolides and bedaclin was being used in, um, in those patients. And then we had a patient um, at Helen Joseph um, uh, ID OPD who had a, a disseminated um, MAC and she was resistant to macrolides and aminoglycosides if I, if I remember. And we used bedaclin um, in her, um, but yes, there is. There are some articles on the Daclin being used, and then clofazamine um, was suggested for a few of the skin uh, NTMs. I can't remember which one though. Yep, definitely establishing itself. I mean, I think it's also it doesn't seem to be a wonder drug with NTMs, though. Not not so much like TB, where we were delighted at its efficacy. It really doesn't seem to have quite the same reputation with the NTMs, but it, but it is being used widely. We've used it in um, uh, transplant patient once who had disseminated MAC for a variety of other reasons. Um, and, and as you said, that, that I remember that case very well, you're talking about, Lauren, at, at, our, at our clinic. Um, 